What I'm going to do, because time is short, is open it straight up to questions, because you've watched the film, and I'm sure you all want to do stuff. Which are the moments you found more difficult, more scary, by uh, filming and being there? What did you want to have access to, and you didn't get access to? And perhaps also access that was maybe a bit more difficult ethically or personally, looking at people being shot and uh, funeral and things like that, which, you know, these three dimensions of access. Um, access was, was difficult in general, especially when I started making this film, which was in 2013. At the time that I started filming, um, I would say a lot of conservationists in Africa were very afraid of speaking out about what was happening. Um, so there was the whole process of meeting people built and building trust. And even though I was well-known photographer and journalist in many parts of the world, I actually had not worked in Africa prior to this film. Well, I guess in, in Northern Africa I had in terms of uh, the revolutions in Egypt and Libya, but in terms of the conservation realm. So it took a long time to build uh, relationships and gain people's trust. And, and then there was the issues of telling the story. I mean, I knew what we could potentially be seeing or capturing in Garumba, but I had, you have no way of knowing what's actually gonna happen when you're in the park. And the park is the size of the state of Delaware. So you, you could have a major incident in the park and be in another part of the park and completely miss it. And I think the things that worried me most during production, I, I have a history of taking risk in my work. But with this, I was hiring people to work with me. And so I was responsible for crew members and that responsibility was heavy. I always felt an um, extreme sense of relief when leaving Grumba and going into Grumba, you know, all the people on the project had life insurance. They had to, you know, fill out their beneficiary forms, which are things that I've done for myself for many years, but it's, um, it's, it's difficult being in that position and asking people and having, and in one case with one person, I said, look, please just fill out these forms. You have three children, if something happens to you, you know, I want them to be able to go to college. Um, so it was it was a heavy amount of responsibility and I'd say that I don't I don't think it would have been possible for me to make this film at an earlier time in my career. It's from the fifteen years of moving around the world and working in difficult circumstances and having a global network that enabled me to pull this all together logistically. Okay. Well, can I just bring you in there? I mean, access generally, trying to unfurl the story and let people know. Is that a difficulty? Is that a... I mean, just tell us how you do it. Um, it well, it depends what level you want to enter the story. So, as an organisation, EIA um, investigates the space between um, the source of the product, whether it's ivory or vinyl or pangolin, and the consuming end, and we focus on the trafficking network in that space. So our guys will go present themselves as buyers or traders, we'll do undercover work, um, we'll engage at a sort of social media level. It's, it's a long drawn out process in order to understand who, who's involved, what their modus operandi is, where the stuff is going, what does it cost, and then we package that up and put it to government. But we're kind of presenting ourselves as, I suppose, criminals as well in many regards. So it's, it's all undercover? A lot of it is undercover. Getting more dangerous? Um, it's certainly, there's a great deal more risk associated, particularly with rhino horn trade. Um, and because the criminal networks that we're looking at are increasingly sophisticated, um, they, you know, they, 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 generate huge amounts of money, they're very well supported, often by corrupt politicians or corrupt government people. So yeah, it's very, it can be extremely risky. I would like to know, it's obviously a call to arms, this, this film, I see it as that, and I just wondered if any, of, if all of you could give us some idea what we as individuals can do to stop this terrible annihilation of elephants, rhino, pangolin, and all these other endangered animals. What can we as individuals do? Thank you. Okay, first in two seconds, what do you want to do and then let's get 
wood in here on that. Uh, one of the things I've been doing since the film uh, first premiered at Tribeca Film Festival last April is screening in places where ivory bands are pending. And the UK is one place, and the EU. In the fall and in winter, I screened extensively in Hong Kong. A band was passed in Hong Kong in late January. Um, so I've been trying to use the film as a, as, as a way to and putting it in front of policymakers and trying to help shift policy. But I think some of the things that have happened as well, the EU had a consultation period that ended in December that was open to the public and the UK did too from October until late December in which citizens could write in and express their feelings about these issues and I I would highly encourage everybody to get very familiar with what the laws are in their country in regards to the ivory trade but also wildlife trafficking and, um, and, and what protections exist and and get actively engaged and use, use your voice to support stronger legislation and law enforcement. What is that working? Oh gosh, is it working? Um, it's terribly slow. I think that's the, that's the thing. I mean, uh, first of all, I, I'm such an admirer of this film and, and Kate's work. I think it is really profound and extraordinary. And um, I watched this film, and I said when I saw it the first time with Kate, I said it's a film full of humanity, because there's a lot of films that are made out there that are um, rather cold and analytical, and this is just full of people. Actually, I was thinking, I was scribbling, sitting on the sofa there, I was thinking it's a, it's a film full of ghosts, full of ghosts of those, as those rangers and and the poachers, and the elephants, and the rhino, and all the other species that Mary's mentioned as well. And I look at Sam, Wasser, who I've known for 15 years, since 2004, I think I took Sam to his first CITES conference, and I see a haunted individual. Uh, he is tormented by what he sees, and how he keeps going, I don't know. Um, so that sounds rather grim. Um, but I think that there is a sliver of hope, and that is, um, I was talking about it earlier with, with um, someone else, um, I was saying there are things you think you can't change, and we all kind of have ideas of what they may be, and I'll give you a couple of examples that have nothing to do with wildlife. One is the Berlin Wall, and the other is the Soviet Union. And you think, when I was growing up, well, the Berlin Wall's never going to come down, and the Soviet Union's here for eternity, and it's not the case. And then you see in the wildlife sector what can be done with a film like Blackfish <coughs> that completely changed the fundamentals around the keeping of Walker in captivity. And I kind of think, you know, people are often saying, who's making the next Blackfish? Well, I think this could be the next Blackfish because I think it has the power to change the way we do business. And I, and I think in answer directly to your question, what can we do? That one thing we must not do is remain silent. We must become the advocates for change. It will not change if we simply allow our politicians, our elected representatives, whoever they are and wherever they're from, to continue to do business as usual. We cannot stay silent and allow those guards to work away with their jammed AK-47s and their rifles that don't work and uh, as they watch yet another body be buried or comrade um, entered into the earth. We have to do something about it. Mary's been doing it for a long time. I've been doing it for 34 years. I guess it's only hope that ultimately keeps us going, and sometimes that hope comes from something like The Last Animals. I think just to... Uh, I just, just, just add to that, to, to, to Will's point that, you know, things change, seismic changes. Um, if somebody had told me 10 years ago that China would ban its domestic ivory markets, I would have laughed because China was our biggest problem. China announced a ban last year. It came into force in January. China is the biggest market for ivory. The UK is the biggest exporter of ivory to markets like China. But now that China has closed its market, all of us and all the neighboring countries have to support China's efforts um, because without our efforts, then what they've done will be undermined. And the UK 
is key to that. Okay, just before we do, the numbers are down, aren't they? The Northern White Rhino this week. Can you tell us about that? Oh, uh, it was very sad. Last week, uh, Sudan, the last male Northern White Rhino died. I was in D.C. and I knew that he was unwell and wasn't totally unanticipated, but um, I have to say I was still quite a shock waking up to many emails and text messages from people who've seen the film or supported the work and uh, knowing that I, how it would, I would feel about it. Um, and it's very, it's very sad. There's, there's now two left. Two left in the whole world. Two left in the whole world. Uh, two, two females. One of the things, uh, having spent time in Africa and looking at what happens to poachers and so on, is that they can go through a judicial procedure. And I you know, looked at uh, what was happening in Mozambique, Tanzania, um, and so forth. And it just, uh, it's just a disaster um, because most people get off scot-free or whatever happens, uh, they're out very quickly. Um, I wondered, um, a comparison, because I've also worked a lot in Latin America, is that drug dealers and so forth ended up getting extradited to the United States. Um, I wonder if there's any way of looking at how one reinforces the judicial, because there are laws against poachers, it exists in Mozambique, it exists in Tanzania, but it doesn't happen. What can be done to improve that judicial system? Um, and whether, when you have internationally known poachers, which you certainly do across the Mozambique, Tanzanian border and so on, whether there could be a kind of interpol for um, uh, wildlife uh, in that sense, and if there's any possibility of, of doing that. Sorry, long question. <laughs> okay, so Interpol have a wildlife crime unit and they are active in space. Um, we know that on the back of investigations that we did last year in China, we provided them with information. Two of those individuals are on the red alert list, so they are wanted internationally. I think in terms of the judicial process, things are improving. But, you know, they started from a very low benchmark. We, we've seen changes in Tanzania. Um, Mozambique has got a long way to go. Um, there is also quite a lot of pressure or focus on investigations using the US nexus. So trying to get individuals who have some way connected to the US where the money has transferred and hit US soil for even a second, they can then work. Um, in that space, and Faisal Mohammed from Kenya is one of those individuals who's been extradited that way. Just the, the Mr. Mombasa that we saw there, which was a surprise verdict, wasn't it, on that? How did that come about? Was pressure put on the government and the judiciary to, to make a, a point of that? Do, do, do you? Um, yeah, well, I think I'm, I'll this kind of address this the last question on this one. But when I started working on this film, the maximum penalty in Kenya was about three hundred fifty dollars and one to two years in prison, with no one ever really getting prison time. So the verdict in the case of Faisal Muhammad Ali was incredibly historic and a game changer. Um, there is an NGO called Wildlife Direct, and they've started monitoring all wildlife trafficking cases in Kenya to make sure that the judicial process is not uncorrupted and they were very, very instrumental in making sure that the Faisal case was um, properly observed. Yeah. So just, just, just briefly to add that, I think judicial training is uh, an important thing and Paula, who you saw in the film from Wildlife Direct, she's been um, instrumental in trying to get proper judicial training. Because if your judges don't know how to interpret the law, how to use the law to maximum effect, or think that wildlife crime is a is a, a sort of um, small petty crime in some way, um, then you will not get those deterrent sentences which are absolutely necessary. Um, but uh, and there are two things. There's there's a, a fantastic network out there called the Eagle Network that operates in five six different countries, um, and. They are an NGO, but they help the judicial process. They help the entire law enforcement process right through from sting operations to getting people to court, to making sure that witnesses aren't paid off, the judges aren't paid off, and that people serve their time. And, and without fear or favor, they'll take it to the top if they have to. But the, but the one thing that all of this relies on is political will. If you don't have political will at the top, this thing 
falls apart very quickly. And we've been reading in the press only in the last few days about how, until recently, Grace Mugabe was going down to the ivory stockpile in, in Zimbabwe and at will saying, uh, I'll have some ivory, please, and or going off and flogging it in order to presumably um, support her addiction to handbags. There's, there is something profoundly wrong, and we must, without fear or favor, hold those accountable hold people accountable right to the top. And where it gets confusing, going to the point about extradition, where it gets confusing is when you have a crime like Cecil being shot, which was illegal. He was, whatever you've heard, we've talked to the guy who monitored him, who knew him, who collared him, and he will tell you absolutely hand on heart that that was an illegal hunting activity. Cecil, Cecil was the, the lion in Zimbabwe, the world's most famous lion. Shot by the dentist. Shot by Walter Palmer. Uh, the dentist in America, and where was was Walter Palmer? He was held to account in the court of, of human of public opinion, but he was not held to account in the court of justice. And if you let that happen, then people in Africa and around the world quite rightly go, "Come on, guys! If you can't do it, why should we?" One of the issues that uh, perhaps we're not discussing tonight, I'd like to lay on it is uh, the idea, and I do spend a lot of time in Africa and I know the bush very well, is the idea of poverty. You know, the, the, the guys that are out there doing the poaching are being paid because they are in poverty and they want the money to feed their families. It's not extreme to, to buy any kind of ornament from ivory or any other uh, 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 animal part. But we have to start really thinking about, and there are organizations that do, thinking about how do we manage and how do we deal with the poverty that is endemic in those regions and why they're tempted. And even those that get arrested and get put away, as soon as they come out, they do it again and they're prepared to take the risk. So I'm wondering what's on the table now with organizations of how they're going to be attempted to manage that. Let's just go to this one, because that's a big question there, that you, I mean, human trafficking is the same and drug trafficking is the same. So this is uh, really going back to the um, Faisal being extracted and the massive change in the, the sentencing for him. And I was wondering how much the way, I'm really quite ignored with this, but it would appear that the trafficking in ivory is now becoming part of trafficking for anything else, be it drugs, humans, everything, and that's coming from maybe one or two few areas. So will the fact that the US government wanted to extradite this particular chat back there for other things help us to combat this? And is that is that coming as a trickle down to how we deal with it on the ground in Africa? I, I just want to jump in and just, just to clarify, um, Faisal Muhammad Ali is actually in Kenya and it's the Kasha brothers who've been extradited to the US and they are in a prison in New York State down the hall from Al Chalo for their, their drug trafficking. Hey, can I just do it on, on, the, on the poverty thing, because you've done the wars as well, which all have this same sort of endemic, you know, people aren't happy, they're poor, they, you know, the, 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 the militia come from that. What connection do you see to the question down here, to the sort of conflict that we've all covered from time to time? The, the poacher, that poacher particularly, you know, will go back to poach again because there's nothing else that that person can do. I wouldn't necessarily, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that. And in DRC, the the laws on um, on being in possession of arms are quite stringent. So they'll get seven years in prison simply for having a weapon. It has nothing to do even with the animals that they that they've killed. Um, so I personally, I see very often poachers as people who are being exploited, that they are impoverished and they're certainly not getting rich in the process of this. It's people like Faisal and the Akashas and higher ups who are really making money from this trade. It, it, it doesn't go further up? Or... Well, the poacher is the, is the sort of foot soldier in this, is the, is the, often the pawn in the game and the expendable pawn at that because that's the person who's putting their life on the line to go into the park and, and shoot elephants or rhino or whatever. The, the guy back in 
wherever it happens to be, who's directing operations, that sort of middle echelon doesn't get them to put themselves in harm's way in the same way, and certainly the guy who's directing operations in a more international sense that tries not to put themselves not just in harm's way but get off the radar as far as possible. I suppose the thing I would suggest is, and I've suggested this to um, all sorts of people, Overseas Aid Development Agency um, to uh, Michael Gove, and in my conversations with Mr. Gove, um, with to number 10, is we spend this year we will spend about 20 billion US dollars on overseas development aid. 20 billion US dollars. That's the that's what the illegal wildlife trade, including timber products, is worth. And I would suggest that if we were intelligent with a small amount of that, by looking at, you know, targeting alternative livelihoods, support for local communities in areas that are most vulnerable, we can't just do it across the whole of Africa or South America or Asia, wherever the, the problem exists, but where they, it can be targeted. Um, we can create communities that are resistant to exploitation because they have something to lose. They have livelihoods that can be lost. Um, if that support is withdrawn, not, not withdrawn, it's the wrong way, I'm not trying to make it sound like it's, um, you know, uh, I'm not trying to blackmail anybody. What I'm basically suggesting is they have nothing to lose at the moment. If their society is functioning through some support that we've been able to offer, even when we leave, when that society is functioning, hopefully they will say to the poaching community, no, not on our watch. Faisal was, he got 20 years for one ivory seizure, but in fact he's linked to more than a dozen, including the elephants that got gunned down in Gramba National Park. Yeah, that's how that works. That's sure, but then the people above that got extradited to the U.S. So you, you're not seeing ivory shipments through Mombasa in the way that you were two years ago anymore since he's been behind bars and since the Akashas got extradited to the U.S. But is ivory still moving out of Africa? Absolutely. He, he's got more charges against him, has he? So that's all. I don't know that going, he's being. I don't know that he's being additionally charged, but I do know that he's linked to more than a dozen shipments of the same type of, you know, mass quantities. It just seems odd because he obviously doesn't do it. He didn't do it on his own. So what, why were there no other arrests? There are other people who are on trial in different cases, and then the Akashas who got extradited. Um, but that it was easier to get the Akashas on drug trafficking than on their role in ivory trafficking. Do you wonder the, the, the question about the economic support that came from over there, how much that would impact? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm aware of, of um, support for a range of forces across various parts of Africa. Gabon is um, well supported. The Kenya Wildlife mm -hmm. Service in Kenya gets support from um, British Army and others who, who provide training and backup and intelligence gathering. Um, some of the resources of international intelligence gathering outfits, state-run ones like the US and the UK, are now deployed to assist in, in, in trying to infiltrate those very networks to understand what's going where and how, and then mobilizing the resources to, to deal with that. But, it, it, you know, it's hard for us to understand, I think Kate raised the point in the film, that Garamara is the size of Delaware, something like that, the state of Delaware. And if you think about um, Savo National Park and the Savo ecosystem in Kenya, it's 40,000 square kilometers, twice the size of Wales. Um, if you look at the Sulu in Tanzania, it's uh, the size of Israel. Um, it is, and, and we're talking of a few hundred individuals trying to protect. It sort of goes to a wider point, I think, and that is, is weaponizing this the answer? Is a military um, option the ultimate answer? And actually, it can't be. At the end of the day, we can continue to fight a wildlife war across all different areas of the world, with species as the target, but humans and species as the victims. Um, and we may win a little bit here, and we may lose a bit here, but ultimately, it will be a societal change and that's the question that I have. Can we get to the point where we, as a species, take a different approach to our natural world? Or are we just going to have this kind of fortress conservation approach, which is really what we have now, as the human population of Africa grows from a billion today to four billion by the end of this century? The biggest question of all is, 
will there be room for wildlife? And if we do have it, will it just sit in little sort of discrete pockets of, of habitat surrounded by a ring of steel and a ring of fire? And I think that we have to try and avoid that at all costs. And to do that, we have to do it now. There's no point in waiting, like Sudan and the northern white rhino. We seem to love a crisis. We don't want to do anything until it's right there staring us in the face. And then we all go, ah, it's too late. They're all dead. But as you said in the film, when a, a, somebody said a species is extinct, nothing actually happens. So there isn't a crisis as such. <coughs> There's one, one question I've got, as uh, sitting here I've got that privilege, is when do people start making money? Because the poacher doesn't make money. At what <coughs> stage does the money start coming in so that it becomes an organized crime cartel that is worth... So they... Poacher is the, the lowest hanging fruit. And so every other person above the poacher will earn more. So that by the time so you'll have the poacher, you'll have the transporter, you'll have the procurer, you'll have the gatherer, you'll have the storer, you'll have the guy who bribes the customs people, you'll have the freight agent, you'll have the freight agent who transships, um, then you'll have the transporter at the other end. So every step of the way, all these people will be making money. So by the time it reaches the market, the profit margin is huge. But the guy at the top of the chain has taken no risk and will get the most profit. So for example, um, a case that we looked at, poachers were getting about $40 a kilo. I mean, this is quite a few years ago, $40 a kilo. Then it was being sold on at sort of 70 then it was sold on at 130 and so on and so forth until by the time it reached the market, it was going for anywhere between $1,500 and $2,000 a kilo. Um, and that's the nature of a network. And um, was, was Pfizer on the top of his network? We don't know because he must have been sending it somewhere. Yeah. So he would have had a he buyer. Wasn't I'm, I'm trying to get an answer to this question. But in, terms of the, Mr. in terms of the kingpin, I think focusing on the kingpin is probably not the best way to disrupt the networks. Disrupting the networks is disrupting those middle players. Those middle players spend two to three years investing in setting up their trusted confidants. So they establish legitimate front companies, they have businesses, they build relationships of trust. Um, two or three years in, they can start making money. If you can take those out, then the next person has to spend another three years doing it. So you've given yourself breathing space. And the other way is to use intelligence-led investigation that's applied to drugs and firearms and human trafficking. When you arrest somebody in the middle, you find a way to get them to tell you who is up the chain. So you work up the way and down the way. Okay. We're going to have to wrap it now, but before we go, what next, Kate? Another film? I mean, what are you doing? What next? Um, I'm helping produce a film on jaguar trafficking, actually. Okay. Give us <laughs> one more line and then we'll wrap it. One more line. Um, I mean, I guess parting thoughts, uh, the rangers who are out there, they typically in Grumman National Park are getting about $170 a month, and when you consider that a little piece of an ivory trinket sells for more than that, it's really quite disgraceful. Um, one of the things that we that I've done is to also set up a foundation, and the idea is to give educational scholarships to children of fallen rangers. So, the end credit song um, done by Emmanuel Joel, for example, is on iTunes, and all the proceeds go for educational scholarships. <laughs>